I feel like the through line in my career has been wanting to find stories that speak to me as a reader, but also demythologize the other. I'm Anjali Singh, and um, at the time Persepolis was acquired and published, I was a young editor at Vintage Books. So I was the person who um, found Persepolis in Paris, brought it to Pantheon, and said, we need to publish this book, and then kind of saw it through its, its publication. Marjan tells the story of growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution, and she tells it from a child's eye view. So I think starting when she's about six until she's 10 is sort of the first half of the book, and then 10 to 14 is the second half of the book. You know, as she would say, she really wrote it to explain her experience to the comics artists and Parisians she was living amongst after she had left Iran. She was working as a kid's book illustrator, and these comics artists were like, oh my god, your stories are amazing! You should turn that into a book. That's how she tried her hand at comics. But I think it really was, like, here she was, this kind of eccentric Iranian with this incredible story to tell and wanting the West, really, people in the West, people in France, and then ultimately, obviously, all over the world to really understand what her experience had been. So I first encountered Persepolis the week before I started my job at Vintage. I went to Paris and stayed with a really close friend of mine who I had studied Hindi with, and she had the book on her bookshelf. And it was February of 2002, and 9-11 had just happened. And I'm, I'm saying that because I feel like that was definitely part of my consciousness of like 9-11 happening and watching kind of a narrative of others. And my family is, my father's family is Sikh, right? So there was just so much backlash in this country. But I also, like Marjan, had grown up in the 1980s against the backdrop of the Iranian hostage crisis. So even I had felt like, oh, Iran, you know, that's a country over there. And from the minute I opened this book and saw the humor on that front page, right, where they have the panel and she's kind of half off the panel, I just felt this immediate connection to the story. And I think I felt other people would have this immediate connection to the story. And because I had been working before I got this job as a foreign scout, scouting American books for foreign publishers, I knew about the foreign rights world. And because it was a small press, they literally had their name and address and phone number in the back of the book. So I called them and I was like, so I'm starting a new job at Random House next week. Have you sold the translation rights? And they said, um, well, we were thinking of doing it ourselves, but sure, you can, you can make us an offer. And then I went to the bookstore and I bought four copies and I printed out all of the reviews and I uh, started my new job, <laughs> holding an Iranian comic book <laughs> in French. Um, Dan Frank gets all the credit because Dan Frank was the person who was so excited that I was there, a young female editor holding up a comic book and saying, I wanna do this. Pantheon had done Mouse and um, Jimmy Corrigan. And I knew those books were two books that had sort of broken out of the, the comic genre. So when I saw that Vintage was part, uh, Pantheon and Vintage were part of the same group, I was like, oh, I know, I, th I think I know who to talk to. But I also had colleagues who read the book who totally didn't get it and said, I don't know who the audience for this would be. And I knew in my bones there would be an audience. Like this was a time in my life where I felt struck by lightning. Like I lost sleep over how much I wanted to publish this book. And I had never been an editor before. But I feel like that was a really important lesson for me in my career of understanding that like these decisions that are passed off as ob objective so often about whether there's an audience and who might be interested in something are really very subjective decisions. And it was never that it became so successful. Of course, that was incredibly vindicating since, you know, there was a whole year of people going, yes, you and your French Iranian comic book, that's nice. But I think it really was that it spoke to me and was a moment when I felt such a profound conviction and like I just knew I knew this book was going to be big I knew um, it was going to be important and I actually had to fight not Dan Dan supported me but um, right after he said yeah go ahead let's make an offer why don't you write to the French publisher and find out if she wants to translate the book herself they wrote back and said oh thanks but no thanks and Dan was at sales conference and I went home and I stewed and I was like no I'm not going to take no for an answer and then I wrote like a five paragraph uh, letter to them, and then I had Marielle, my French friend, help me translate it into French, basically persuading them that this book was so important that Americans from like 9 to 99 would read this book, and that we were the perfect publisher to do it because we had published Mouse, and this book had been compared to Mouse in the French press. And that was ultimately what convinced them to work with us, because here they were, a French 
Marxist Comics Collective, and here I am, a representative of Penguin Random House, or actually it wasn't Penguin Random House, sorry. Here I am, a representative of Random House, big, bad corporate America, and I didn't see myself that way. You know, that was something they were really leery of being involved with, because what I didn't really understand at the time is how alternative the comics world really is and how much they really saw themselves as outsiders. But they also knew that they had something incredibly special on their hands, and they didn't want to mess it up. They didn't want to do the book and have it be successful and not be able to meet demand from France, and then they didn't want to do the book and have it not be successful and feel that they hadn't done right by it. But it was my passion, but also the fact that I was at a Pantheon, and I could say these are the books we've done, and that the company overall, overall too, is a company that publishes books in translation, which is also, I didn't quite realize it at the time, incredibly unique. Like, the Knopf list was quite an international list, so they could hold the comics, and then they could hold who Marjan was. It's a question I've turned over a lot in my mind about um, why this book spoke to me so immediately and intensely. And I think it has a lot to do with actually growing up as, as who I grew up as, which is half Indian and half American, kind of between two worlds, but um, always feeling a little bit other, and then landing in publishing and feeling a little bit other. And this is a story, she's not talking about being other, but it was a story that felt like it made the other so familiar. It was sort of like, I think all of us, right, who have connections to other cultures, wish that we could have a story like Persepolis to show everyone to sort of make that culture feel really accessible. So I, th I think it was that, and we're generationally the same person, so I was someone who considered myself super cosmopolitan and well-traveled, and yet I realized that I had my own preconceived ideas and prejudices about Iran. It was a country I, and a culture I didn't knew very little about, and this book kind of unpacked that for me. It's been popular because it communicates in such an immediate way. And it is, for me, an example of the power of words and pictures and how together they can deliver something more complex and more lasting and more emotional than one or the other alone. And there's something incredibly universal about it. I do think part of the success here is that this was a book in translation, but a book that was really very much written to explain something to us, right? It was written for us in a way. And that's rare for translated literature. Um, I also think Marjan's an incredible talent. Like she just has an incredible way of synthesizing complex ideas into um, into visuals and into um, I, I don't know like into into panels that really pack a punch. Like I remember so clearly this panel about it was like a deconstructed bicycle, and she said this is what the revolution looked like in my country. Just how powerful that was as a as a as a quick way of understanding a really complex reality. It's nice to commemorate a book that has been so, I feel like, game-changing in the world of graphic literature. Before there was a Persepolis, we didn't really have, um, I think, books for young readers, honestly, in comics, other than like the Tintins of this world, or books that sort of spanned sort of young readership and adult readership. Persepolis really is still relevant in a way that's kind of sad, because we still really frame Iran as, as um, an enemy country, and I feel like, Here's a way of uh, understanding a country that's politically framed in a certain way as also being made up of people just like us, um, struggling for a different political reality. I feel like there's been just this incredibly long tail that Persepolis is responsible for of helping people understand what kinds of stories you can tell in comics. I have, now I'm an agent, and I have illustrator clients, some of whom were children and teenagers when Persepolis was published, who've told me that book gave me permission to tell the story that I wanted to tell in comics or to grow up to be a comics artist. That feels incredible. Yes, yeah, so I think the attitude towards graphic novels has changed so much in the last 20 years. I think that's a lot thanks to Persepolis because it opened teachers' eyes and publishing's eyes to uh, the potential readership for a, a story like this, and then opened their eyes to sort of different kinds of stories that could be told in a graphic form. But also we had then the birth of uh, First Second and other um, sort of publishing arms that have also done a lot. But Persepolis helped, like it really did help break down the walls. And now we have like a super burgeoning comics industry in the kids' book space, but I still want to see more comics for grown-ups, and I want to see comics published for that generation that grew up reading comics, that are hungry for comics and aren't um, snobbish about comics. I meet a lot of creators who are interested in doing comics, work, like fiction, right? They would like to tell a story, a fictional story in comics for grown-ups, and that's just something we haven't really made space for. But Persepolis has ensured that we have made space for a certain kind of memoir in comics. <laughs> 
There's a part of me that has always wondered whether the very first book I acquired as an editor is going to be the most famous book that I ever did. But it's also helped me a lot to have a calling card in my career, to be able to say, um, yeah, this is what I do, and you may have heard of this book. 